Please rise in body or spirit as you are able. Blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we, would look, that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inquiry of us all, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, 
and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The psalm for this evening is Psalm 22. We will read it responsively by verse with the congregation responding after the asterisk. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One. And from the common praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man. Scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted on the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb. And kept me safe on my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. And there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of fashion surround me. They open wide their jaws at me. Like a rattling and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle round me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They hide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword. Right from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. My wretched body from the horns of the wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the same deeds as he has done. A reading from Paul's letter to the Hebrews. 
Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have only one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. may be seated.
Then Pilate had Jesus taken and whipped. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. Over and over they went up to him and said, Greetings, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Pilate came out of the palace again and said to the Jewish leaders, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no grounds for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and their deputies saw him, they shouted out, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told them, You take him and crucify him. I don't find any grounds for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders replied, We have a law, and according to this law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be God's son. When Pilate heard this word, he was even more afraid. He went back into the residence and spoke to Jesus. Where are you from? Jesus didn't answer. So Pilate said, You won't speak to me? Don't you know that I have authority to release you and also to crucify you? Jesus replied, You would have no authority over me if it had not been given to you from above. That's why the one who handed me over to you has, has the greater sin. From that moment on, Pilate wanted to release Jesus. However, the Jewish leaders cried out, saying, If you release this man, you aren't a friend of the emperor. Anyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he led Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, in Aramaic, Gabbatha. It was about noon on the preparation day for the Passover. Pilate said to the Jewish leaders, Here is your king. The Jewish leaders cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate responded, What? Do you want me to crucify your king? We have no king except the emperor, the chief priests answered. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. The, the soldiers took Jesus prisoner. Carrying his cross by himself, he went out to a place called Skull Place, in Aramaic, Golgotha. That's where they crucified him, and two others with him, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a public notice written and posted on the cross. It read, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Therefore, the Jewish chief priests complained to Pilate, don't write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and his sandals and divided them into four shares, one for each soldier. His shirt was seamless, woven as one piece from the top to the bottom. They said to each other, let's not tear it, let's cast lots to see who will get it. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my clothes among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing. That's what the soldiers did. Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. After this, knowing that everything was already completed, in order to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was nearby, so the soldiers soaked a sponge in it, placed it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When he had received the sour wine, Jesus said, It is completed. Bowing his head, he gave up his life.
It was the preparation day, and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath, especially since that Sabbath was an important day. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of those crucified broken and the bodies taken down. Therefore, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men who were crucified with Jesus. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. The one who saw this has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he speaks the truth, and he has testified so that you also can believe. These things happened to fulfill the scripture. They won't break any of his bones. And another scripture says, they will look at him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take away the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one because he feared the Jewish authorities. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body away. Nicodemus, the one who at first had come to Jesus at night, was there too. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, nearly 75 pounds in all. Following Jewish burial customs, they took Jesus' body and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths. There was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified, and in that garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish preparation day and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus in it. Please pray with me. It is finished, completed. Oh, holy God, your astounding love is a mystery. We come this evening longing for the faith to receive your unfathomable grace. Precious Savior, patiently transform us to be your hands and feet in our broken world. In the name of the triune God. Amen. It's been a tough year. A year of huge and surprising challenges for all of us. I bring my very full tender heart to you knowing that it is a privilege for us to be together on this holy evening. Reverend Isaac. You are an exceptional priest and colleague. Thank you for having me and all of us here today. And thank you, beautiful siblings of Trinity, for having us here together. Our parish's joint worship this evening and tomorrow evening is a beautiful representation of Christ's intent for the church's unity. Both of our parishes have relatively new rectors. I've just passed a year. You're almost there. And both of us have had heart-ripping loss. In my parish, we are still reeling, reeling from the death of our beloved, life-giving, long-time, 54-year-old minister of music, Mike Salvatore. It's a grief that's right there and in all of our hearts. So let's start by acknowledging that many of us are hurting, truly swimming in sorrow. There's no denying that our world is broken. Our personal pains are right here. Ah, but friends, these pains are held in the larger landscape of a geography of pandemic anxiety that heightened the norm. Anxiety is so thick that it seems like the whole world is on edge. 
massacre, genocide, war, famine, floods, and overt misinformation, and undisguised oppression are so much the norm that we, who are privileged, often look away, burdened by the sheer magnitude of it. Are you as weary as I am? How can we possibly respond? This evening, what you just heard, you being here, is perhaps our most potent response. We gather to remember the one who shows us the way of God. The events we remember this evening remind us that the very, very, very worst things, the execution, the torture, the death, the worst things in our life are not the last things. God is still in control. I also think it's fitting that our parishes are together. You see, Emmanuel means God is with us. And our church has been trying to live into our name. Emmanuel, God is with us. And I can think of no more beautiful an expression of God's interpenetrating love than the truth of the Trinity. God the Creator, God the Christ, God the Spirit, swimming together here is active in our world and, yes, is active in our lives tonight. So take a deep breath. And let that settle in your body. The triune God is here with us. So what is the gospel message for us this evening, my friends? What is the good news? Specifically, my question tonight is, I wonder if you, like me, have ever wondered whether the cross is part of God's plan. And how do we, as followers of Jesus, engage with Jesus' execution on the cross? Every year, on this Good Friday night, we read the familiar words from Isaiah that Gail read. No, did not. Yes, read for us. Sorry. These Isaiah, Isaiah words talk about the Messiah as the suffering servant. This passage comes from what's called the fourth servant song in a climactic part of Isaiah written explicitly for the exiled Israelites who were being brutalized by the rising Persian Empire. There, that's your history lesson for today. This suffering servant was to be, oh, someone who would bring Jacob back to God, it says a few chapters before our reading. The Israelites were desperate migrants in a foreign land, oppressed and longing for their home country, which lay in ruin. Does any of this sound particularly familiar? The prophet Isaiah shows us that this servant Messiah would come from the outcasts, not the rich, not the powerful. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hid their face. Huh. He was despised and we held him of no account. The exiled Jews found comfort in looking for a Messiah who was like them also an outcast. Now we read this passage every Good Friday because the earliest followers of Jesus, long before we became an empire religion, the earliest followers knew these words, knew Isaiah, and they quickly turned to them to explain what the death of Jesus might mean, might mean. Theologian John Hayes wrote that these words from Isaiah, quote, enabled the earliest Christians to understand and communicate to one another and to the world at large the meaning of the death of Jesus, end of quote. 
So is there hope in the execution of Jesus on the cross? Now remember that the earliest followers of Jesus, like the Jews in Isaiah's time, were also people living in an occupied territory, this time under the brutal oppression of the Roman Empire. Jesus, representing suffering servant, gave them and us a way of seeing God as inhabiting their suffering and raising up, like them, the other. Isaiah says, he was oppressed, this suffering servant. He was oppressed, he was afflicted by a perversion of justice. He was taken away. Again, does that sound familiar? God is not distant. God sees and is with the other and does not turn away. Can this message, can this be a message from the cross for you and for me this evening. In Jesus, Messiah, Christ, God is with you in your most painful places. God sees and knows you intimately and loves you despite what you see as your failings. And, even more importantly, God sees the ones we pass by. God sees how our society, well, our society, how we're treating indigenous peoples, persons of color, migrants, immigrants. That's a list. All you have to do is open your ears, open your eyes. And close to home for me, God sees the trans youth and the LGBTQIA plus community. God desires us, desires the other. Can we, when you see the cross, can you see a servant Messiah who is with you and with those on the edges? Always. That's the promise. Now, the Gospel of John beautifully read, gives us a different perspective on the Messiah. And I wonder if you noted how Jesus seems to be in control throughout tonight's narrative, even to the end, when he concludes it is completed. I admit that it, I was a little bit surprised. John's Jesus is so different from the Jesus depicted in the Synoptic Gospels, the other Gospels that are a synopsis. There's no agony. There's no, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No, John describes Jesus in complete control and willing obedience to God, his Father. It's helpful to remember that the Gospel of John was the last of the Gospels to be written, probably by at least 40 years. The community that wrote this gospel was in a fierce struggle with the synagogue structure, kicked out of the religious establishment of their home, their Jewish heritage on one hand, and oppressed by the suspicious Roman military on the other. The Gospel of John was written for one purpose, stated multiple times throughout the gospel, to proclaim that belief in Jesus as the Son of God was the key to eternal life. Even the prologue of this gospel states it, that, quote, to all who received him, to them who believed in his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. I love John's Jesus, because it's easy for me to believe that this Jesus is God's Son who has victory over death. Did you catch how many times Jesus was called a king? not to mention the moment when he spoke of his own kingdom. And I tell you all of this because Jesus brings us to the cross with him in assurance of God's activity. Jesus' mission is planned, and the cross is part of that plan. We can have hope that God uses Jesus' horror and torture for good. But let's be clear. 
that the cross is a result of the systemic sin of the imperial culture and its reaction to Jesus' subversive, counterculturary, revolutionary message of radical love and acceptance, especially for those in the margins of society. Indian Jesuit priest and biblical scholar George Soares Prabhu wrote in The Dharma of Jesus, quote, the cross is no arbitrary intrusion into the life of Jesus. It is the natural outcome of a life of solidarity with the poor and the outcasts and of confrontation with the powerful who oppress them, end of quote. Oh, friends, if there's a message for our terribly broken world today and our own personal sorrow, it is the hope and the choice of the cross. The choice is between a kingdom that suppresses, oppresses, and strips humanity of every basic dignity for the purpose of greed and power and control, or a kingdom, a basileia, as we've been talking about in my congregation, a basileia, a kingdom that washes the feet of the poor, where the lowest are first, and where justice is equal for all. This kingdom, the one that Jesus said is not of this world, is not yet, but it is also here. It is present when we strive to make it here. Last week, Trip Fuller said that, I love this quote, the good news becomes good when the body of Christ does it. I said this last Sunday, so I apologize. For it. The good news becomes good when the body of Christ does it. The cross does not deny the pain of life. Jesus embraced your, the world's pain. And through it, we can be transformed as God's children, working for this kingdom that strives for the flourishing of all without exception. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. May it be so. Amen.
the solemn colics. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs of him in everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Alan and Carol, our bishops, and for all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them for Joe Biden, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for those who are ill or disabled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you that we may find your mercy present with us in all our afflictions, especially for those on our prayer list. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, 
that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, those whose faith is known to God alone, may we be accounted, may we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of the resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We glory in your cross, O Lord. Praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving help among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins, our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Before we move to uh, receiving communion from our reserve sacrament, um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank our siblings from Emmanuel Church in Wakefield um, for joining us this evening, and Brett particularly for that very good word. Thank you. Um, our, uh, uh, as Brett mentioned in his sermon, our services continue with our great vigil of Easter tomorrow at Emmanuel Church in Wakefield. Please come. And we will uh, then be in our own churches to greet um, the risen Christ on Easter Sunday, Trinity at 10 a.m. 8 and 10. 8 and 10 at Emmanuel. All are welcome. We remember that this is God's table and not our own. Everyone is welcome and everyone is invited to this table if you wish to encounter the real presence of God in Christ at this holy meal. For whatever reason you prefer to receive neither the bread nor the wine, 
Feel free to approach the altar rail as well and simply cross your arms across your chest to receive a blessing instead. But wherever you are on your spiritual journey with or towards God, know that you are welcome and you are invited to this table. And now please join me in the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God, holy food for God's holy people. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgments and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Be his mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest of the dead. To your holy church, peace and comfort, and to us, sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit who live and reign, one God, 
now and for it. Um, Thank you. 